So hello everybody, my name is James Thomas and I'm a developer advocate for IBM working in our cloud division. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking to you about a new way to, to kind of build and run APIs in the cloud without having to set up or manage any infrastructure to be able to do this. Right now having to provision VMs, now having to create containers, now having to install Linux environments and set up middleware and databases and all that kind of stuff. And to do this, I'm going to be introducing a new type of cloud system called Service Cloud Platforms that allows you to do just that, to run code in the cloud without setting up or managing any infrastructure. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, why? why would you want to do that, right? Why would you want to run APIs, microservices in the cloud without having any control or managing any infrastructure? Well, the reason is this. Right? Servers kill your productivity. And you might not realize it yet, but trust me, it's true. Right? And I think by the end of this talk, you're going to agree with me that servers kill your productivity. You're going to want to go back to your office on Monday, gather up all of those Linux machines that power your application, set them on fire, and be free forever of the tyranny of looking after infrastructure. Right? I think servers are just one of the worst things that's ever happened to software developers. So why am I so convinced right, that servers kill your productivity? Well, imagine you have a great new idea for a new application or service or API you want to develop. You've got some customers who want to try it out. Uh, so you finish the code, you've got the code all done, and then you think, OK, I'll just get myself a server. I put the code on the server, and then people can use it, and everyone's going to be happy. But as soon as you provision that first environment, that first VM, that first container, suddenly you have all of these extra tasks to take care of. You, you know, if you're using VMs, you have to, to set up and manage the Linux environment, put your middleware and database and all that kind of stuff on there. Once it's running, you have to monitor it in production to make sure it's healthy. You need to be thinking about security. Is it backed up? Is it encrypted? It's secure. And then hopefully, as your API becomes successful, you need to think about scaling. And scaling, for most people, means more servers, more environments, more VMs. And suddenly, you find yourself spending all of your time looking after your infrastructure, not actually on writing code in the first place. Now, at this point, you might want to stop me and say, well, hold on, wasn't, there, wasn't the cloud supposed to fix this? I've always been told, I'll just put my back end in the cloud, and all my infrastructure challenges go away. Uh, well, unfortunately, as many of us discover, as I did myself, right, who develop in the cloud today using things like infrastructure as a service, what the cloud turned out to be was just renting VMs in someone else's data center. And it turns out that virtual servers still kill your productivity. Right? Maybe you don't have to physically buy the machine anymore and turn it on and do the networking, but you still have to, to set up and manage the environments and think about scaling and security and all of that kind of stuff. And this is not really what I want to be doing. So uh, what can we do? Right? I've told you the way that we develop in the cloud today is terrible and user service is terrible. What's a, what's a different way? Well, I'm going to introduce you today uh, a new way to, to build and run APIs, backend microservices in the cloud using what they call serverless cloud platforms that build as this next generation cloud computing service uh, that really is going to revolutionize how I think we kind of build software in the cloud. But again, you might uh, stop me, you want to stop me at this point and scratch your head and say, well, hold on a minute, maybe you're a bit cynical and think, well, you know, is serverless, this new cloud platform, really that different from how we develop the software in the cloud today? You know, is it different than using containers or VMs or anything like that? But serverless cloud platforms are different, and they're different for a couple of reasons. The first is that they shrink the unit of deployment. So rather than having to, to wrap up your application in a, in a huge VM or some kind of monolithic deployment package, you can literally take the, the raw microservice code, the raw function code, push it straight up into the platform, and have it executed on demand as API request comes in. And this is where the term serverless comes from, because rather than uh, you as a developer having to think about and manage the environment that it runs on, it's all the platform's responsibility, and all you have to focus on is the code. Uh, another nice thing about serverless cloud platforms is that scaling is the platform's responsibility. So your code, your, your microservices, your serverless functions, as we call them, get started on demand in milliseconds whenever API request comes in. So when you get lots of load, lots of requests to process, all the platform does is it just scales horizontally. It spins up new instances of your microservices on demand in milliseconds to process every single request. So rather than you as a developer having to think, OK, if I've got a server and it's got this much RAM and CPU and memory, how many requests per second can it cope with? Now that's the platform's responsibility. 
And service platforms, as well as scaling go up, right, to cope with loads of load, they also scale down. And they scale down to zero, because your code is only running because it gets started up on demand when it's processing requests. So if you've got no load, you've got no, you know, you've got idle time with your application, your API, your backend, none of your code is actually running, which is really important when we think about the pricing model. Serverless, like all cloud platforms today and cloud APIs, it's, it's pay as you go, right? You pay for the milliseconds that your code is running to process requests as they come in. But with Service Cloud, you don't, uh, your code is only running when you're doing work, when you're processing requests. So for the first time, all of the idle time you have within your application, guess what? Now you don't have to pay for it. And this can lead to some, this I think is a really underappreciated aspect of serverless, the, the kind of cost advantages, and can lead to some really, really uh, significant cost savings for people. You know, there's lots of use cases online of people, uh, you know, talking about saving 80, 90% off their monthly cloud bill by moving from, from infrastructure service over to serverless for certain workloads. OK, enough talking about serverless in a very high level and abstract way. Let's quickly uh, create, an, uh, create an API in five minutes and show you how kind of easy it is to use one of these platforms. Now, today I'm going to be looking at a platform, a technology called Apache OpenWhisk. This is the kind of core platform technology at the heart of, of IBM serverless offering, which we announced about two years ago. But we open sourced the whole platform and donated it to Apache, and it's going through that whole incubation process at the moment. Uh, and recently, both Red Hat and Adobe have come on board to, to adopt it as their official technology. So it's going to get some traction in the open source world. It's not just an, it's not an IBM project anymore. It's, it's an Apache project with multiple backers. But if you are kind of interested in serverless and you're thinking, OK, which platform shall I use? There's, there's dozens of different options for you to choose from today. Every big cloud provider has some kind of serverless offering these days. Um, but I think there's a couple of good reasons I like OpenWhisk and to, to, to look at OpenWhisk. The first, obviously, is that it's open source, right? It's a full Apache project. So if you want to run it locally, you can do. You can deploy it yourself. If you're on private cloud, you can go to github.com and look in the source code and, and check out how it works and things like that. Uh, and one of the reasons that IBM open sourced our core technology of our service platform, which I think everyone who develops in the cloud today is very worried about vendor lock-in, especially with serverless. You're going to be tied to some proprietary platform or API for life. And what happens if they deprecate it like pass.com? You know, you're going to, be, going to be stuck. And most of the service platforms today aren't actually open source. So we think by open sourcing, the core technology gives you developers the ability to have more security and longevity for your serverless apps. Uh, another good thing about OpenWhisk is that I think the runtime support. So with all service platforms, because you are uh, you don't have to manage or set up the environment your code runs in, you're kind of dependent on the provider to support the languages that you want to be able to use. And these are the ones that OpenWhisk support. So Node, Java, and Python are supported uh, kind of out of the box. And they are, I think of them as first class serverless languages. So pretty much every platform supports them today. Some which are a bit more OpenWhisk specific. Uh, PHP recently got added into the platform. Um, this was came from the community, the open source community, not from IBM. Um, Swift is also in there, so you can push up raw Swift code to execute on the platform. You know, Swift was a language developed by Apple to build native iOS apps, and then they open sourced it a couple of years ago, and people are doing backend development in the language as well. And I, I really like Swift, but I also think it's great for mobile developers who want to quickly create an API or a backend in the cloud without having to manage any infrastructure using the same language. But the best thing I think about um, uh, runtime support in OpenWhisk is that it's extensible. So actually, you can pretty much run anything you want on the platform as long as you can wrap that in a super lightweight Docker image. So using OpenWhisk, you can push up custom Docker runtimes to use on the platform. If you want to execute Go or Ruby or Haskell, anything you can wrap up in Docker, you can pretty much execute. And that is something that's very, very specific to OpenWhisk at the moment. Most of the other proprietary ones don't allow you to do this. So we've got our serverless platform. We're going to use OpenWhisk for some of the reasons that I've just talked about. Uh, the next thing you need is you need some code, right? You need some microservice code or API code that maybe looks a little bit like, uh, little bit like this. But the question everyone has at this point is, OK, when I've got my code and I want to push it, you just say I push it into the platform, how does the platform know what to do, that how to execute it when API requests come in? Well, for whatever runtime you use, there's a tiny little interface you have to add to your, your function. And this is what it looks like for, for JavaScript. So in your JavaScript file for your API code, which could be thousands of lines long, you just need to have a function called main. And that's going to get called every time an API request comes in with the event parameters. And whatever you return from that function will be serialized back out as the kind of JSON response. 
So using OpenWhisk, if you finish all your JavaScript or your Java or your, your PHP or Python code, you've added the interface to the platform and you push it up into the platform, uh, OpenWhisk creates what's called an action. And that action is the name we use in OpenWhisk for your serverless functions. I think of them as like sleeping microservices waiting to be woken up to process API requests whenever they come in. Now, when you've created your, your functions, your serverless functions on the platform, how can you uh, invoke them programmatically from other applications or actually expose them as API endpoints? Uh, well, one way is through what they call the platform API. So OpenWhisk has a very, very well-documented uh, RESTful API for interacting with the platform, where all you have to do is send a HTTP request to the platform endpoint, and you can invoke your functions on demand. You can create new functions. You can get the results of execution. And you just need to send an authenticated HTTP request with your credentials to be able to invoke it programmatically. And there's even client libraries available for lots of programming languages to make that super easy. Now, if you're building APIs, big, very you know, high-traffic enterprise APIs, at this point, you probably think, well, what about you know, API routing? I want to have different serverless functions being invoked for different paths and operations of the request coming in. What about rate limiting? Obviously, I don't want you to call my function too much and cost me too much money. What about you know, authentication for the user with their credentials rather than my developer credentials? And if you're talking to the, the platform API directly and you want to add some of those features, you have to kind of manually do that in the code. You look at the request parameters coming in, and add those features in. And that's not a very scalable uh, approach, right, or a very enterprise approach to dealing with some of these concerns. So the, the pattern, the architectural pattern that everyone does with serverless development, if you're building public API endpoints, is to use an API gateway from your cloud provider. So all big cloud providers have these API gateway services, and API gateways allow you to define public API endpoints that can call private APIs in the background. Uh, and OpenWhisk uh, comes built in with an API gateway that it talks to the platform API to allow you to do this. And the nice thing about API gateways is they handle all of that stuff for you. They handle routing, they handle authentication, they handle rate limiting, they you know, core support, kind of out the box without you having to, to kind of manage it yourself. So uh, let's, let's have a look. I've got about five minutes left, and let's, let's do this. Let's create a quick API uh, as a serverless function and then kind of expose it publicly so you know, anyone could kind of call it. So let me mirror my, mirror my screen. OK, you can see that. So obviously, uh, the first thing you need is you need an account with your service provider. And I'm going to be using an OpenWhisk, uh, an instance of the OpenWhisk platform today. OpenWhisk is open source, so you can go, you can download, you can run it locally, you can deploy it yourself uh, as a VM. Uh, or I think the easiest way is just to go and sign up for a free account with IBM's cloud, and you get uh, IBM Cloud Functions is just a hosted version of OpenWhisk that you can kind of use on demand uh, and start to play with the free tier. So I've got my, my OpenWhisk account. I'm ready to go. The next thing you need is you need to get some code from my laptop up into the cloud platform and create one of these actions. So again, to do this with most serverless cloud providers, it's just a little command line utility you download and install that allows you to interact with the platform through the platform API to create new functions to invoke them on demand. So as I use OpenWhisk almost pretty much every day at the moment, uh, I have this uh, utility download installed and kind of ready to go and authenticated. So uh, we're ready to, to create some service functions. So I need some kind of API to create. So um, imagine you work for a retailer, right? You're building the front end to a, a retail site. And the retailer has the brilliant idea that they want to integrate Bitcoin into their application, right? So they want people during the checkout process to be able to pay with Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin as a currency fluctuates like hour to hour, even minute to minute at the moment. So you're not going to embed the Bitcoin prices in the product database. You want some kind of API that you can call during the checkout process to do the kind of real-time conversion. Uh, so I've got some code, and I kind of want to create my API to do this using uh, OpenWhisk and using serverless cloud platforms. Now, because this is a very short talk, I have uh, the code all ready to go. Uh, and I'll just kind of walk you through it, and then we'll quickly deploy it and expose it as an API. So it's just a bit of JavaScript, because I like, I like JavaScript. Uh, and you can see that in this JavaScript file to implement my API endpoint, I have a function called main, which is going to be when the API request come in, this is the function that's going to get called by the platform, passes in the request parameters, and it's looking for an amount and a currency to convert. Uh, and then it goes and does an, an async HTTP request to another API from Coindesk. Coindesk is a Bitcoin wallet that publishes the real-time spot prices on the currency market for Bitcoin. So it goes and gets current prices of Bitcoin in dollars or euros and the amount, does the conversion down the bottom, bit of math, um, and returns you the equivalent amount of, of kind of Bitcoin. So if I want to create a serverless function, uh, what we call an OpenWhisk action, uh, you can really do this using the command line. So I can say whisk action create. 
Um, I'll call it, you give it a name, say Bitcoin. I give it the path to the source code. Uh, and then when that has been created, I'll just check it's been registered. So you can see my workspace have a new function called Bitcoin using the Node.js 6 runtime. Uh, and now I can invoke it. So I can say whisk action invoke Bitcoin. Uh, I need to give it some parameters. So I need to say an amount, let's do like 10,000 Bitcoin, super expensive. Uh, we'll do like dollars. Uh, and I'm going to call it. It's going to call the platform API. Platform's going to spin up some kind of environment somewhere, inject my code, call my code, and serialize me back out response in, you know, in kind of milliseconds. And you can see I can call this function again. I could now call it like a thousand times in parallel through the platform API, and it's just going to it's just going to work. So okay, we've got our JavaScript code registered on the platform. Let's expose it as an API. Um, so to do this, I can go back to the management console in IBM's cloud. So as part of the, the hosted offering, we do integration with our API gateway. Uh, and so I can say, OK, create me an API from my OpenWhisk action. I give it a name, Bitcoin. Uh, I'm going to give it a path called API. So you can see I can now start to do things like uh, the routing. So I can say, you know, path, uh, verb, get. It's going to call my action uh, Bitcoin. going to give me back some JSON. Uh, and you can see, because I'm using API Gateway, now I can, I can turn on all of those things we talked about. If I, if I cared about authentication and rate limiting and OAuth and cores, then I could toggle those switches. I don't have to handle that in my code myself, which is, which is super nice. So hopefully, it's going to create me a new API Gateway endpoint that I can then execute from the command line as a, as a kind of public API to invoke my service function. So I can say HTTP get uh, API Bitcoin. And I have to say amount equals like 1,000, currency equals two US dollars again. And hopefully, it should just work. Right, so there we go. Right, same, same JSON has been serialized back, but now it's a, it's a completely public endpoint. And I could give you that URL, and you could all call it as much as you want, uh, and it's going to cost me a bit of money. But you know, I'm not going to have to think about servers or scaling or any of that kind of stuff. And you know, within like four minutes, I've taken some code from a laptop, registered it on the servers platform, and now I've got a super scalable kind of cloud API that I could start to use within my application. OK. So uh, I said at the start, let's talk that servers kill your productivity. And hopefully, maybe now you agree with me, right? All that time spent spent installing Linux and patching kernels and worrying about middleware versions and all that kind of stuff is actually time that you're not spending on your product, on writing code, on listening to users, on, on kind of pushing out of new versions. And as developers, I often think that it can feel like you're held hostage by your infrastructure, right? I want to spend time in my ID, writing code, and I spend it kind of hunched over some Linux terminal trying to debug some kernel panic in uh, some remote provider's data center. So I want to encourage everyone here, if you are building kind of modern cloud-native applications to, to power APIs, think about embracing the serverless revolution, right? Burn your servers, deprovision your virtual machines, delete your containers, right? Be free forever of the tyranny of looking after infrastructure. But more importantly, upgrade your productivity, right? Stop spending your time managing VMs in someone else's data center and get back to, get back to writing code. So thank you very much. Um, we don't have any time for questions, um, but...